Is Happy it? Wednesday. Happy Thank you. Oh, it's just great. Um, I'm Edith Deschel, Dr. D. I'm the director of the E.W. Scripps School of Journalism, and welcome for day two of our Centennial Symposium as we're gathering as friends. We have 17 alumni who traveled from all parts of the country to come and spend some time with us sharing their experiences since they earned their degrees from the E.W. Scripps School of Journalism. Special thank you to Smith and Pat Sch Schooneman. Um, the Schoonemans were our donors for our Schooneman Symposium that we had for um, more than a dozen years, 15 years. And so um, we had some leftover funding and they said that please use it to help celebrate our 100 years of journalism education at Ohio University. And so my, my assignment is to officially welcome you. So welcome and happy Wednesday. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Victoria Lepo. Dr. Lepo will be moderating this session. And as you've noticed, each of the sessions have started with the ones who. And my um, the the jargon I learned, not jargon, but for the trivia, for the trivia game, I learned is that that was the the first part of the title for each episode of Friends. Um, those of you who remember or watched Friends, the ones who. Well, I didn't know. And so I learned something new. And that has been the theme over the last couple of days is how much we are still learning, even once we leave Ohio University. So thank you, Dr. DePoe. And, and thank you to our to my kids. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you both for being here today. Uh, seated to my uh, far, far right <laughs> is Michelle Moira, uh, and she brings more than five years of public relations and in industry experience to hybrid digital client roles with a passion for healthcare communication and a love for all things social digital. Uh, her background includes working alongside, uh, alongside clients across all sectors of the healthcare space. Uh, including roles of strategic plans of development, um, implementation of digital initiatives uh, for corporate and executive social media channels, including um, agency level work and internship programs, DEI, educational exchange program and agency social media strategy and implementation. And one thing that struck me when I was reading through this was the one-eyed cat, Lily. <laughs> and I was asking if Lily would be watching today. Um, and you're based out of Brooklyn, New York, is that correct? Okay, great. And pardon me for a second. And next to me, to my closest right, is Meg Omasini, a senior corporate communication manager at Visa, focusing on risk and security. Uh, spends her days developing media strategies and thought leadership campaigns about how Visa helps clients keep their money safe. I was thinking last night, I'm between two of the best like people. I have healthcare and keeping my money safe and inclusivity. I mean, what, what better place can I sit right now? Um, before Visa, Omasini led communications for Miss Universe and Miss USA brands, which took her everywhere from leading a press event from the Dead Sea to spreading a vaccine initiative to Mississippi, um, worked on the agency side at Endeavor Global uh, Marketing, and also worked on brands such as Bumble, uh, McDonald's, and Microsoft, uh, and so forth. And you're also in Brooklyn. Is that correct? I am All right. with my cats as well. Oh, with cats as well. All right. We have lots of Bob cat and cat lovers. So great. It overflows with Bob cat and cat love here. All right. So we'll just go ahead and, and talk about um, OU and uh, what, you know, has made um, journalism and your life special by, you know, com coming to EW Scripps and then, and then moving on. Uh, so when you were, when you think back, I mean, you know, hindsight is 2020 and so forth when we reflect, um, what media and or professional organizations uh, were you involved in um, why you were here and how do you see that helping your career now? I'll start he here, Mara, if, if that's okay, and then we'll, we'll move over. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so I was in three um, organizations in the J School, mm -hmm. um, like a lot of people here, uh, a lot of alumni, I started mm -hmm. off at WOUB. 
Um, I was a reporter for Hardwood Heroes, and um, before that, I had never watched a single basketball game. Um, <laughs> so I thought this is a perfect time. Um, and so I, you know, I, I got on, I got onto Hardwood Heroes. I started reporting and writing, um, and uh, that was that for me was a great experience because it taught me how to like interact with people, how to um, interview, how to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also taught me that I didn't really love mm -hmm. doing broadcast journalism. So mm -hmm. then I was like, okay, what else can I do? Mm -hmm. um, and then I joined Backdrop Magazine. Mm -hmm. And so then um, I was there for about a year. I was at WAB for two years and mm -hmm. Backdrop for a year. And um, that taught me the value of collaboration mm -hmm. and you know, going in to like a team environment and um, you can't go in 40% and expect everyone else to like give 60, like it's mm -hmm. um, equal effort. Mm -hmm. So collaboration to like get a product from the ground to um, print. And then I also learned after that year that I didn't love um, print journalism. <laughs> um, and then uh, one of my friends, Grace Driscoll was like, you know, you should join Impressions. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's called 1804 Communications now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, okay, like, let's see, you know, what PR, what's going on over in PR. and. Um, I joined Impressions my junior year as an account executive, and then uh, I loved it. It was mm -hmm. like, I was like, this is where, I, where I'm thriving. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in the news and information track from freshman mm -hmm. year to uh, senior year, so I graduated on the news and information track. But what I learned from that position, so then my senior year I was um, comms director, so I was like a big jump there. But um, what I learned from that is that the degree that I'm getting is very flexible. It's not, you're not put in a box. Um, and there's so much that you can do when you graduate. And so um, that's how I got into PR through impressions. That's that's excellent. And I think that it's so, um, personally, as a professor, I think it's so nice when you are able to have those experiences and, and do that while you're in school and not take that pressure of you, off of you and not have mm -hmm. to do that as a professional. How about, how about you? What do you see happening in your career and as you uh, reflect now about OU? Yeah, um, can you guys hear me on this one? Sorry about that. Um, so yes, I also um, really benefited from the professional organizations at OU. I also came in as a news and information major my whole life. All I ever wanted to be was a journalist. I had a neighborhood newspaper when I was seven, the Tremont Weekly. It did not win any awards. Um, <laughs> but um, then I came to OU and I was like, I, I will be on the Today Show one day. And I very quickly learned I was not cut out for it. I just did not have the heart. I couldn't picture myself, um, you know, doing the small town life. I always knew I wanted to be in New York. Um, and so that sort of brought me to PR. I really felt lost. And so that was really great that there was another tract for students like me who felt really lost when you're like, okay, this is all I've ever wanted to do. What What is that next step? Uh, and I really felt like it was great to have that second path there. Um, and I ended up taking two semesters off during school to intern. And so when I came back, I felt really equipped and ended up being the campaign director for the National Student Advertising Campaign that year. And that was at, this at the time, and probably to this day, the most holistic experience on running a campaign I've seen. You know, you starting with the marketing insights, learning all about the core consumer, building towards a creative idea, Thank God there were other people on my team to help with that. Um, and then what are the PR levels you're pouring? What are the event activations you're pulling? And then putting it all in a really beautiful design deck and then presenting to really, really cool people in the industry. Um, so that was some of the real world experience that I wouldn't have gotten until, you know, many years into my career that was amazing to have at OU. Yeah. And, and you mentioned creative and the different levels of strategic communication. And, and for those in other track, those are some of the things we teach here at, in the Scripps Journalism School, EW Scripps Journalism School, is uh, you don't have to, you know, be all of it. You know, we have professors that teach creative and we have professors that teach management and, and public relations. So you, you can really be specific and, and hone, hone those skills that you are talking about. Uh, which classes uh, do you, you, you spoke about a specific experience. Are there any classes or skills? Um, I know I can't remember sometimes, you know, what I ate for lunch a couple days ago. <laughs> so general's okay. Um, are there any classes, uh, skills, or professors that you found or moments that helped uh, with your career? Maura, do you wanna? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I think I, a couple of alumni said this yesterday, but I took um, gender race in class with Dr. D. I don't know if she's still here. And she's in the back. She's waving her hands. Um, she's in and the back. And that was probably one of uh, my favorite classes because it helped, you know, put into perspective that, well, first of all, as a black woman and seeing a black woman teaching this course, it was, um, it was inspiring and it was um, validating. Like we can, you know, be in these powerful positions and um, it taught us the value of, you know, recognizing how socioeconomic status and gender and race um, impacts uh, the various audiences that we're gonna be speaking to and how you have to tailor your message um, so you like just making sure that you're speaking to the right people, sending the right message, um, and then coming out of this like bubble that you're in in college and realizing like the world is bigger than um, these bricks here in Athens. But that I would say that's my favorite class. Yes, we're very fortunate to have Dr. D be our director, for sure. Yeah, for me, um, uh, Professor Davis uh, just left, but he had an agency management class that I took my senior year, and he was the client um, and we were part of his agency um, and I really recommend starting in an agency for everyone and that was a great crash course in it and I was telling him this yesterday I still remember one of the lessons we had was doing a review of our time in class similar to how you would do in school in in work um, I still hate reviews I walked into that review and I burst into tears mm -hmm. and he was like what do you think I'm going to say to you that's so mean? Like, what do you what do you think? And so now every single time I walk into a review, which is something you get, you know, every six months, every year in your career, I think about that time. I thought about what he said. What do you think I'm going to say to you that's so bad? Mm -hmm. um, and it really helps me calm down even to this day. So really loved that. Well, I really appreciate both of you touching on so many important aspects of curriculum and what we talk about um, in our classes. Do you have, well, you've shared favorite memories, were there any internships um, that you had or uh, additional experiences um, that you would, would like to discuss? So my uh, sophomore year, I interned at a publication in Columbus, I'm from Columbus, so mm -hmm. I um, interned at a publication called Columbus Underground. and. Um, that was super fun um, seeing my name on these articles online. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a professional. <laughs> um, and I was able to explore a lot of uh, Columbus and a lot of businesses like writing um, about the culture and things like that. So that was that was a really good one to again also expand my um, what I'm thinking about outside of the classroom. And then my junior year, I interned in New York City. Um, and that was when I fell in love with New York City. I was like, I have to live here. But it, that was at a PR agency. Uh, we were doing influencer work, um, analytics, data reporting. Um, and that also was, that helped with um, the foundation of my career today too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had two internships while at OU. The first one was at an integrated marketing agency in the comms department. Mm -hmm. um, and that was great because it was uh, B2B PR. Uh, um, I think that's not something that you think a lot about whenever you're in school, mm -hmm. but someone needs to get the products of a heating and cooling system for businesses into publications. I just didn't understand what why would I be writing about this? Who cares about it? But people do, and it impacts their business. Mm -hmm. And so that was great. And coming back to school with that foundation, um, I reapplied for the Miss Universe internship because I did not get an interview the first time I applied for it. Um, in my second year, I was very fortunate to get that and interned from uh, that January to the following August in New York. Um, it was at Miss Universe at a really interesting time. It was when Donald Trump still owned it. Um, he announced he was running for president while I was an intern. Um, we were dropped from the broadcast schedule of NBC because of the, some of the comments he made when he announced he was running for president. Um, and all of a sudden the PR department was my boss, Jackie, who was a saint. Um, myself and another intern, Angela Keen, who also went to OU. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they had this really major crisis communication situation and she had interns talking to the New York Times, um, which was crazy. And I still don't talk to the New York Times all that often. So it was a um, it was a sort of surreal experience that made me really confident coming into my senior year that I could sort of take anything that was thrown at me and made me sure that coming out of graduation, I wanted to live in New York. Mm. Interesting. Do you want to, uh, I don't know if we have um, students also watching, but do you want to talk about what B2B PR is for those who may not know? Uh, sure. So B2B PR is um, business to business PR. So it would not be something that 
me, Mega Massini, would go out and buy. Um, the brands that I worked on at that time were metal coatings um, for buildings. And you're like, oh, what is that? So, you know, in order to make a building more energy efficient, they would they developed all these very interesting chemicals to put onto the metals on buildings. This is not very interesting, I know, um, to make it more so. And so we were having to pitch a lot of the business publications, so trade publications for businesses, um, to talk about those medical Koenigs and the benefits for it so that someone who's reading about their industry will see this and think, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, and so that's a really great field that I don't think a lot of people know about going coming out of school, but there's so many career opportunities, especially if you find a lane and stick with it. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, would you like to tell us about uh, your journey to your job, how, how it actually came about going from the classroom into the, the business office? Yeah, so I, um, I actually was very lucky in how I got my position. Um, I had a friend from home who I was talking to her about graduation. Um, Professor Young knows this, Dr. D knows this, mm -hmm. Professor Stewart. Um, I was terrified of uh, post grad. I was like, "What's gonna What's gonna happen?" Like, I don't know. I, it was, there was like a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, and Professor Rogas. It was just like, it was a lot. Um, and so my friend um, from Columbus, she was like, "Oh, my cousin is a managing director at a PR agency in New York City. You should email her." Mm -hmm. And so I was like, "Okay." And so I sent her an email, and um, she was like, "You know, we'll look and see if that's something we're interested in." And then I think it was. Um, March, so before graduation in April. And she sent me an email and it was so funny because the email was the subject of the, like she, there was nothing in the body of the email, just <laughs> in the subject. It was like, hey, do you still wanna move to New York? And I was like, is this spam? Like, <laughs> what, <laughs> what is this? Um, and I was, I was, I responded and I was like, yeah, this sounds like great, a great wow. opportunity. And so then she put me in touch with, um, I did an interview, I did a writing test, um, and then I got the position and I was very lucky to have a job post-grad so early. Like usually okay, it's, right. you graduate and then you like do the job search. I think only like business courses you get, or business majors um, have mm -hmm. that much like lead time. Mm -hmm, and so um, I, took some, I took a month off after graduation, moved to New York City, and then I was, you know, you go from this environment where all of your best friends are living right down the street from you. Um, you have all these people who are supporting you, all your professors who are like helping you guide you, helping guide you through what you're doing. And then you're thrown into a city of 8 million people. Your first right. job out of college, you're mm -hmm. uh, 5, 500 miles away from home. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, I think it was, a. I would say it was a very difficult transition, at mm -hmm. least for the first six months. But mm -hmm. Um, I was, and I was also lucky that it was a smaller agency, so mm -hmm. I was able to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so my first, I had a few clients. Um, one was a, a company that was in the um, Parkinson's and MS mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about Parkinson's and MS, but I, I learned. And so that mm -hmm. was drafting content for their uh, Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, and then there were a few crisis management um, issues, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I was, and then after that, I moved on to working for um, Pfizer Oncology, and that's where I was for about three years. And mm -hmm. that account was um, also, I didn't know anything about oncology and having to manage um, mm -hmm. a lot of different brands or a lot of different treatments under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to learn how to like read data and understand mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. um, reporting, I think uh, one of the alumni yesterday said, she doesn't like it when she says, she says journalists don't like, or aren't good at math. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay, like you don't have to be like a math expert, but it, especially now it's so important to be able to know how to interpret data. Um, mm -hmm. That's where all of, when the results come through, you have to be able to say, you know, this is how much we invested into this campaign or this um, post or whatever, and um, here are the results, and this is what this means. So mm -hmm. we continue on to, onto this path, like mm -hmm. developing strategy for brands in that way. So. Um, that was, and I, I was doing that, I was like mm -hmm. right out of college. It was That's the awesome. craziest thing. Um, and then I am now at a different agency, but so at this um, this agency, I have two clients right now. Um, one is a dermatology biotech and mm -hmm. um, we helped launch their first first treatment mm -hmm. uh, in the pipeline um, for plaque psoriasis. Uh, it's a non-steroidal treatment. And it was uh, also a very rewarding experience because I've also never been able to, um, see a drunk launch from like wow. beginning to like end mm -hmm. like 
when it goes to the um, customer or the consumer. And um, my boss actually ended up, the digital lead that was ahead of me ended up leaving. And um, I did have a lot of support on my team, but then it was like, okay, Michelle, this is you. So mm -hmm. I was working on um, like top to bottom strategy to literally posting on their uh, Twitter and LinkedIn pages, wow. developing content for the executives. And um, I think this is, I, I just, I love my job. Like this is the most <laughs> fun I've um, had in a job. And um, the other client is also in oncology, but mm -hmm. I think um, the journey is, it's, it's being flexible and willing to learn and willing to get feedback and mm -hmm. um, going into that room and being, and like, what do you, you know, what have you done? Like, what, what are you, what are you learning? Like, what are you working towards? Mm -hmm. I would say definitely. And and one thing I appreciate that you both have talked about are the many facets of public relations. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about research, market research, and crisis communication, and even news and information skills about yeah. reporting and, and so forth. How how do you feel like your your classes prepared you from evolving and being flexible or do you feel like your classes and and in what ways may i ask yeah i can um i think the one thing that's really important for being a good person in public relations is having a deep passion for the news and just wanting to read it and think about what's interesting what's not what does that publication cover what would they never cover and then learning um how to fit your company's message into those publications. Um, so I think what was really great here was just like learning about what the post was working about on. And I worked for the IT department in a communications role and, and now in tech PR. So definitely had experience there, but what would be an interesting story for the post to tell about my client, um, the tech department and learning to think about that. And then also following the careers of the people I graduated with. I'm actually someone from my learning community, Kyle Wiggers is speaking later today. Uh, um, and uh, he's a top tier tech journalist that I met through my time at OU and um, is someone that my, my clients know and love his coverage. So that's also another great, those connections of following your, your news and information colleagues. And what advice would you have for students today? If, um, you know, I have, I give tours and, um, you know, I'm, I'm director of studies for our honors tutorial college journalism students. And, you know, I have, I have parents and students asking me all the time, you know, how do students find jobs? And, and what would you, what would you recommend, Michelle, uh, for finding a fabulous job like yours, for instance, that's so interesting. And I know you had your email with the subject line, but where would, where would students go to find this? Uh, future students, would it be LinkedIn or what would you re would you recommend to find that internship that leads to the job? Where should people go and look? Uh, yes, LinkedIn, um, bother as many people as you can. Uh, I <laughs> like we sometimes we're a little busy. We like, can't check our emails um, as often or, you know, our personal emails at least, but go on LinkedIn, find those connections. The Bobcat network is so strong. Um, I think there were times when I was looking for a job and I would just look up Ohio University and like find them like where do they work and, and LinkedIn will literally tell you like 26 alumni work here, you know, update your LinkedIn profile, go on and bother people and then, um, well not bother, but you know what I mean, and I would say um, the advice I would give you guys is to do everything wholeheartedly. Um, when you're working, when you're out in the field and working and uh, you just have to like be super passionate about what you're doing and like going all the way because uh, otherwise people will notice. Um, and so putting your best foot forward, putting all your effort into it. And then if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out and you go to the next position or you go to the next thing. Um, but just like doing everything wholeheartedly and making sure that people know that you're committed, you're dedicated, that you're, um, you're there, you're there to work, you're there to bring value. Do you have any thoughts to add to that, Meg? Uh, yeah, um, I think the most, there's two really important qualities, I think, in people just out of school. It's humbleness and curiosity, and it's knowing, you know, I felt like coming out of school, like I knew so much, and then you enter your first job, and I was not good at my first job. I was just 
I, the deadlines were hard. The, the, if something was wrong, you didn't really have a second chance to fix it. It was wrong and your boss had feedback for you. Uh, um, and that was really difficult too. So coming in with the, I actually now am at the bottom and I need to learn a lot and um, take that feedback. And it's not personal, it's business. Um, it's something I still need to tell myself today. Um, so I think that, and um, you can't overstate the importance of showing up on time. Um, that I think for interns and people first out of school, like I'm still terrible with it, um, but showing up and being there and being present and asking questions and Googling your questions before you ask them, um, those are all really great things and really make people earlier in their career stand out. My first job was actually at a consulting firm and I was really bad at passive voice, but now I can teach passive voice like a beast, like I can really teach it. So I understand what you're saying. It's, it's funny how um, some of the things we aren't you know, the best at end up becoming good, you know, great skills in the future. Uh, do we want to turn to questions now, uh, Professor Young? Uh, does anyone in the audience uh, want to come up to the microphone here and ask uh, some questions from our friends and fabulous alumni with all these uh, great teaching points here for us today? Don't be shy. We're just having a conversation. Hello there. Um, I would love to know what you think makes a good client. Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a tough one. I wanted to ask that one yesterday to hear what other people had to say. <laughs> um, I'm constantly asking the agency that I work at um, <laughs> if they hate me or not. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, for me, I think it's bringing people in um, as soon as you know about something. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think something that's really hard at an agency is sometimes you feel like you're the last to know. I was at an agency for about three and a half years, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, don't you know this deadline that is coming up? And they're like, well, how would we know that? You didn't tell us about that. So bringing people in and really treating them as a partner as opposed to someone that you hand work to, that helps everyone succeed. Um, and it also makes it a just better work environment. Um, and then also respecting boundaries. Um, I think sometimes whenever you don't know what the person on the other end looks like or talks like or that they're another human, it can be really easy just to like, get frustrated or, or um, say say something in a way that you wouldn't to someone that you know personally. So just taking a step back and giving that that moment of grace is definitely important too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, I agree with um, respecting boundaries, uh, especially when you work at an agency. You know, sometimes you might just be working on one account uh, on the agency side at least, or sometimes you might be on two, three, me, if you're on four, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but when you have a client that respects your boundaries, um, that's not sending, that's not ex expecting you to respond to emails after hours. Um, that's, I think that's just super critical because when you're working on so much and across uh, various accounts and um, working at the agency level, like working on agency work as well, um, it, you're busy and, you know, just taking the time to be like, okay, um, you know, maybe they can't get to this right now because it's 7 p.m. and they're probably watching Succession. Um, <laughs> just like respecting those boundaries. That was, that was a good answer. Um, it seems like you pretty directly hit your goals. Um, what were something that you did that hindered reaching your goals? Yeah, I can start. Um, <laughs> This is, this is an embarrassing story. So whenever I was 22, I made the worst mistake of my life. Um, the kind of mistake you can make at 22. Um, I moved, I quit my job and I moved to Germany with my ex-boyfriend, operative word ex-boyfriend, um, quit my job, made this very public announcement and it lasted six weeks. And it was really embarrassing. Um, and I had to come back and I was so, I was working on Visa as on the agency side and I was so passionate about the client. And I came back and begged for my job back and had to take that moment. And it was a huge moment of fail failure and people being like, well, where were you? What happened? And also that I didn't have the continuity. I missed all these things and also had this major embarrassment in my life. I think that was a huge failure, but also shows that you can do something that is objectively the wrong thing for your life and come back from it and, and be fine. And it's a very funny story. Uh, it's great for parties like six years later. 
I would say um, in the moments where I felt, okay, this is not going great, um, it was when I was not asking for help and leaning on the people around me. Uh, you have a team for a reason. You have professors here for a reason. You have advisors for a reason. They're there to help you. Um, ask questions. If you're struggling in classes, just like ask how you can um, better manage your workload or things like that. And I, that was that was big for me, having to learn, okay, it's okay to ask for help. Like, yes, you want to be this powerhouse PR girly, but, um, you know, ask for help. Like, tell your team you need it. You're, tell your boss that your uh, plate's too full. And everyone's always willing to help. And it, it's just really important because then you burn out and then then what? You have to work for the next 45 years. So um, always ask for help. Hi, guys. Hi, Dr. Hi. Hendrickson. Hi. Uh, so I'm just curious because PR is outside of my wheelhouse. Um, I know at least when I worked in magazines, people always you know, thought, oh, Carrie Bradshaw. No. <laughs> so I mean, for you, you know, Kim Cattrall or whatever her name was, cast name was, oh yes, oh, yeah, sorry, Samantha. Um, are there misnomers about your positions or your jobs that you feel um, you would like to share uh, with the group? Um, I guess, I think there's a difference between being like a publicist when you're working like with a like a celebrity publicist and you're doing PR for like one person versus um, doing PR for at an agency. So I would say that's the biggest difference, like you're like who you're working with. Um, but I, everything else is pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, for my POV. I think I'm nicer than Samantha, but I, I don't know. Um, I think that there is a reputation that you have to be really cutthroat and that also you can't be honest. Um, like I love the West Wing and CJ Craig is my queen. I would love to be here one day, um, but she's one of the only like publicists in um, you know, pop culture who shows that honesty is the best policy, because if you ruin a reputation with a journalist that you're working with because you've lied to them, which you sometimes get pressure to do because you are aware of things, it's a lot of times it's better to say nothing at all so that you can't, don't respond to the email, don't respond to the question, say I'll get back to you on that, um, because once you hurt your reputation with that 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 outlet or just you as a person, you can never get that back. And so I think that that honesty is something that it's always a lot of lying on, in pop culture, which I don't think is this big in, in the real world. Hi, how are you guys? <laughs> um, I was wondering if you guys had any advice for maintaining a work-life balance at a young age, because I know when you first start working, it can be super hectic and a big adjustment. Should I go? Sure. Maintaining a work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, it's just it's important to find something that you're passionate about outside of work because then your your work kind of tends to consume you otherwise um my passions are eating i love like i started a food instagram and then i i don't know i don't even remember the password uh, like creating content a lot <laughs> um uh yeah like finding something outside of work that you can really like be passionate whatever, whether that's reading or like listening to podcasts um I, with, with the pandemic, life is so different now. I work from home almost all the time. I go in, into the office a few times, but um, when we all started working from home, I would wake up in the morning, go go to my desk, click, 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 and next thing you know, it's 8 p.m. And I'm like, okay, I just worked a 12 hour day, mm -hmm. but like on accident, cause you're just like sitting there, you're at home and like, so it's like finding that like barrier, like that boundary that you're, mm -hmm. um, you're gonna say, I'm not gonna cross this, like after, 6 p.m. I'm gonna go and like watch my shows or read a book or go on a walk. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is I, I'll wake up whatever time, um, usually like nine o'clock, <laughs> um, and then I'll do my face routine. I'll or I'll take a shower. I'll listen to a podcast, and then I'll like get to work unless I have to, like a lot of urgent emails to respond to. But it's just finding like what is important to you outside of like that area, especially because my desk is like 20 feet away from my couch, so can't escape it. 
Yeah, um, I think that your first couple of years, it's really hard to communicate those boundaries. Um, um, I definitely didn't know how to do that. Uh, um, my two best friends are from my first job because we were with each other in the office until 9 p.m. They're probably watching. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, they. I think that that was great because you learned and you would have to cancel your birth birthday dinners with people or not show up to plans or not use the tickets that you had to go to something and that was really hard. What I found as I've gotten older is one that time is temporary um, because those assignments do tend to flow downhill. I, I think that it's, you should expect for it to get better. I was just talking to one of my former Miss Universe interns the other day and she's like, how do you do this? I'm like, well, it does, it gets better because you're able to communicate it. And also you're able to say, this is not a workload that is sustainable. So the earlier you're able to advocate for yourself in that way, I definitely think that that helps a lot. And then for me, there were some non-negotiables. Like even if I knew I was gonna be working until 9 p.m., I had a gym two blocks from my office and I would go and I would take 45 minutes at the gym and like go on the elliptical and I would feel so much better mentally about my day and physically, and then probably do work better after that because I had you know, renewed energy. So finding those things that are non-negotiables in your day and communicating that to people, like I just block out my calendar, like, um, sorry, this is what I'm doing at this time. Uh, um, and generally people are respectful. It's whenever you really try to hide your boundaries that I think people have more issues with it. I'm gonna piggyback off that question with things like Slack and Teams and even Signal. Do you find yourself, um, I don't know if you have them on your phone and your laptop, do you find yourself having to turn some of those things off or managing those? I know I volunteered for um, nonprofits and, and, and different things, and those would go off a lot. Um, how do you find yourself set, setting boundaries even with technology uh, sometimes? Or do you have to set boundaries with work technology? Yeah, on vacation, I take email off my phone um, just because I don't want to really want to read it. And they have an out of office saying, I will return to you on Monday. And uh, um, and you set someone else, and that's the beauty of having a team, is someone else can field that and they can take that for you. Or um, as my first boss would say, it's PR, not ER. Like nothing is going to happen <laughs> that is that bad. So, um, I think that taking your email off your phone and then also uh, something about, we use teams and you can set like i'm away right, i am right. busy do not disturb that's really nice too yeah same um i actually i took the week off and i um had i deleted teams and outlook off my phone because i was like no like if they need to reach me if it's really that important then somebody will call me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but yeah that it's just mm -hmm. deleting it off the phone because otherwise i would I will check it. Yeah, I understand. I'm the same way. <laughs> Do we go ahead? Oh, yes. I have a question. Hello. I'm an alum. Um, my question is, what is something surprising about your job that not only people in this room and in the journalism school, but anybody would be surprised to hear about that you're you find to either be like a challenge or something you're proud about? Something surprising. I can say, um, I find it, I, so I do mostly like cybersecurity stuff at Visa and that's like, I, I didn't do any of that. You know, I, I like to read rom-com books. It's, that's not my general passion, but uh, I think that something that's surprising and challenging is working with those executives who are, people at Visa who work on fraud or the best people in the world who work on fraud. And I think what's, it's, what's been surprising and challenging for me is taking that really technical hard information and making it for people like me or like anyone in this room to understand um and also how easy it is when you what like the, oh my god whenever people started talking to me about what they did it was i literally felt like that meme where she's like looking at the numbers going around um and then after like three months of people saying all these things and these initialisms and technical terms, it becomes so much easier. Um, and I think that's what you'll find is that the first couple, it feels like they're speaking a different language to you. Um, and then taking that really technical terms, thinking about it, plugging in that piece of information there and that person information there, and then you do become the expert. Um, I think that was very surprising to me. And talk to me about payment fraud. I'm, I'm here to talk. <laughs> 
I would say something, at least from my experience, that was surprising is uh, I came in, both of the agencies that I work at are small, smaller agencies, maybe about 50 people. And what was surprising for me is that I was able to do so much. Mm. Um, I was able to like hit the ground running like on day one as an account coordinator and still to this day, I'm all, it's like bottom to top for every single project. And I think that was, that was, I was like me, like you want me to do that? Are you <laughs> sure? Are you sure? Um, so team small agencies. <laughs> When I'm talking about public relations in my classes, I really emphasize the, the team base, the teamwork approach to projects and that people bring their respective expertise to that piece of the puzzle. So going back to something you alluded to earlier with regard to the pandemic, how did that affect the team dynamic when you're you know not in the same room and just kind of tossing ideas around and and you know sharing across the table that sort of organic process that happens and you're just looking at people on screens how did that affect your ability to do your job and do you think it affected the effectiveness of what your organization was trying to do during the pandemic yeah i it was really really tough um especially for the first couple of months because one we were still trying to figure out the technology of it all um and kind of like setting rules like are we doing camera on are we doing camera off um so i would say yeah it was it was pretty tough um but then you kind of just like you have to be flexible in this career um in, in like journalism um pr like in in media in general you have to just be very flexible and um from like a team dynamic just understand like you know giving each other grace we're not robots um we're people who have emotions um so yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, I was at Miss Universe during most of the pandemic, um, and we put on uh, a pageant in Memphis, COVID capital of America, in November of 2020. Um, and we were planning all of that remotely. And it was really difficult because, one, there was the whole fear of, I don't want to go somewhere and potentially get COVID. But then also, um, things would change so quickly that when you're in an office, you can be like, well, this is this is the update. This is the update. It's the, this is the update. And I think something that as a communications professional you had to work on is making sure everyone was on the same page, mm -hmm. because if someone missed an email or wasn't put on an email or any of those things, um, just making sure everyone was operating under the same set of facts was really was a difficult transition. But I think that you guys, when if you're anyone who's entering the workforce now, you have the benefit of all of our mistakes. So um, it should be a lot better, it's better now. Okay, so this is not Professor Rogus asking this question. This is just <laughs> audience member Mary. Talk about some ethical challenges mm. that you faced. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, so I just mentioned I was at Miss Universe um, and I loved your ethics class, Professor Professor Rose or Mary, um, whichever you prefer. Um, and the show was in Israel and the way that Miss Universe works is that the tourism bureau of that country or that place, they want you to put on sort of a three hour show. And it had to be very one sided about an issue um, and something that I, I try to pride myself on is hearing a lot of sides. And that was really difficult for me to take one side of it very politicized issue and then also write messaging that was very one sided um, balancing my personal feelings of you know shades of gray to being sort of one sided was really difficult and I had a couple of meltdowns about it um and uh it called my aunt who had worked uh, in in israel and been like how, how do i do this how do i advocate for everyone and not just the the, the my present challenge and and that was really difficult in the way that I did it is shining a light on human in, human stories and human interactions was the only way i knew how to how to do that and that was how i came through but it was definitely um ethically a, ch a challenge for me during that time. I think when you think of big pharma, um, everyone has a has the idea of, in their mind of what that term means. So I found it a bit difficult at first to kind of be like, okay, am I, you know, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> um, but 
so when I would take those like personality tests in high school, um, it, it always would pop up like that you're like a teacher, like that you're meant to be a teacher. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Um, but because I'm here in PR, but um, I think of my job in as as a patient and healthcare provider educator. So if I'm able to put aside like the you know what all the negative sides of pharma and just stick to this it you're educating patients on the treatments that are available for their cancer or you know people who have living who have been living with um, psoriasis for 20 years and they've been taking steroids and it's not working they're going through steroid withdrawal it's like here's this new treatment that's gonna you know not like selling it like you know it's for profit for money it's like we really want you to get better and I think that's how um, I, I like get over those hurdles but you know, everyone's always like, big pharma is so bad, but we, we do care. <laughs> we truly care. Hi. Um, so salary transparency has become a big topic in the past few years. So I was wondering how you managed things like asking for a raise, negotiating your salary, and managed to live in New York off your salary. Yeah, um, so my first salary was $35,000 a year, no overtime. My um, paychecks were $990 every two weeks, and my rent was $1,200, and it was very hard. And I said this <laughs> last night, at that time, I was like, I'm just never going to be, I, this is not sustainable. The thing is, is that there, I will assure everyone who's entering that, you do have room for growth pretty quickly. You need to sort of swallow that really tough year or two and what's really hard then is you're also probably working the hardest you'll ever work in your career um and know that there are room for growths and sometimes for that it's a terrible thing to say sometimes you need to leave that job because that's really where your salary hikes are going to come they're not going to come because you know your company they might think you're the best in the world but what they're trying to do is balance a budget and attract new talent and that's sort of where those dollars are going so if you feel like you're not being paid what you are worth and you know what you are worth um jumping and leaving a job is something you shouldn't be afraid of like you don't know the, owe these people anything you've done a good job and you deserve to be paid what you are valued and making that move is sometimes very important i would also add that it's it's like learning how to advocate for yourself like she said she said earlier is really hard so if you don't if you like don't have the courage or the strength yet to do that it's finding someone who can advocate for you whether it's a mentor um, within your like group at your team or your office or um maybe another colleague who can help you like practice the salary negotiation um conversation but what i think it it's a law now that they have to have the salary ranges at least in new york mm -hmm. um I, whenever I was like going through my rounds of reviews, I would look what's the salary of this current position at other agencies or um, at other internal companies and you know, is, is it comparable or do I need to like ask for more money? Am I making more money like that kind of thing? Um, and then just making sure you're like you're like, like she said, like you deserve to be paid for what you're doing. Um, so always I always say like ask for that raise like ask for that bump because it's it's how you live. Um, and in terms of living in New York with the salary, I think you just kind of make it work. <laughs> sometimes I, you know, you eat rice <laughs> and ramen. Um, sometimes you go out with your friends. Um, in that vein, since we have somebody working for one of the largest uh, financial investment firms in the world, and also Michelle, is there an amount of money that you would recommend that students have in a rainy day fund? Uh, to either help them between the transition from graduation to that first job or to help in a situation such as what you've described for at least the first six months. Yeah, you can't really save money when you're making $35,000 a year. Um, I think you just have to trust in yourself and know that you will take a job that might not be the job you want to stay where you are. Uh, um, and maybe living out really far or commuting in or taking a second. I, um, I freelanced through my first year and babysat um, to make things work. Uh, um, I think that it's, it is hard, but also 
you you can do it that what you what seems impossible at the time also just having any money when you're out of school feels awesome it's like oh my god i just got a paycheck and it's for a lot of money and it's really exciting and then it's like oh it's gone now um uh but they say six months i don't think that's probably real very realistic for your first couple of years out of school i think that more of that is knowing that you can pivot um and that you can trust in yourself and um, someone said to me once, money is an unlimited resource. There's always more to make. Um, and just knowing that that you have that within yourself um, and you'll make it work. So don't freak out about that, I promise. Yeah, and I was very lucky when I first moved to New York that I my family was extremely supportive. And they were like, go live your dream, girl. We've got you. Um, but I would say, I guess, at least having like a, one or two months of rent just so you know that you have somewhere to live um but i i don't know let, let i me, do not have a rainy day <laughs> let, let me if let it me, rains it's gonna pour let, let me bring it closer to home would you recommend that students brew their own coffee and cook their own meals and put that money into a rainy day fund oh i don't know i think it like it just depends on like what you value and like what you like are you want to get out of what you're what you're doing in your job or um, in the city that you're in. I personally was like, I'm in New York City. I'm going to go have fun. <laughs> um, so I, I just think it depends on I wouldn't like restrict yourself, I guess, like if that's not the kind of person you are, if you have to do it, then I guess, you know, do what you have to do. But I don't no, know. I, I, don't I was think. thinking during your college years, so you could be saving oh, a little money before yeah, you graduate. That could work. I before I moved to New York City, I got like a temp job at like Jimmy John's delivering <laughs> sandwiches for the month because I was like, I don't know what to do. And um, but yeah, it, putting a little bit away here and there. Um, like I said, I, I don't know. But I'm also, not the best like students, job financial advice. student jobs don't pay any money. Like I worked at Ping. I was a supervisor at Ping, and I made like seven eighty five an hour. Uh, um, I think it's hard to save save money when that's what you're making. Um, coming in, into New York, what I would try to think is what my salary is is this 425 coffee worth the joy it's going to bring me <laughs> and maybe it is and maybe it is and, and taking that in be like is it worth the 20 minutes of work that it would cost for this and sometimes the answer is yes sometimes the answer is no it's just knowing what that value is for yourself mm -hmm. that makes fair, sense. fair enough um our next session begins at 10 45 it is broadcast the ones who produce dr lapo if you'll wrap up this session please I just want to thank you both very much for your time and uh, we both appreciate we all appreciate you so much and if if anyone wants to connect with you uh, do you have a recommendation are you open to being connected with online as long as you throw that follow on twitter just kidding um yes please add me on linkedin um mego massini i'm the only one mego massini plus visa you'll find me yeah same like i said bother me if you need to all right thank you so much thanks everyone thank you.